don't you go ahead and stand? I want to read some scripture as we get started. I want to read from Psalm 91. It says, Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. He says, This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust in Him. And then it says, His faithful promises are your armor and protection. So we're going to sing just that. We can trust Him, that His promises are our armor and our protection. Again, welcome to Brookstone, and let's sing together. In the eye of the storm, you remain in control. In the middle of the war, you got my soul. You alone are the anchor when my sails are torn. Your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. When the solid ground is falling out from underneath my between the black skies and my red eyes, I can barely see. When I'm feeling like I've been let down by my friends and my family, I can hear the rain reminding me. In the eye of the storm, you remain in control. In the middle of the world, you got my soul. You are changing 
we can stand. All other ground is sinking sin. That's just a great promise. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ. We can stand on the promises found in his word. It says that we can, we can rest in his promises, that our confidence is found in his, in his faithfulness. We sing that all other ground is sinking sand. The first song we said, when the solid ground is falling out from underneath my feet, you can just see that theme of going, I want to stand on the rock that is Jesus Christ. Through this life, I want to stand on the rock that is Jesus Christ. It says in 2 Corinthians 1.20 that the promises of God, the promises of God uh, find their yes in Jesus. And then through Jesus, we say our amen to God. So we want to sing that. All the promises of God are yes and amen, yes in Jesus. And then through Jesus, we utter our amen to God. So we want to sing a new song for you called Yes and Amen from 2 Corinthians 1.20.
Let me welcome you to week number five, week number five in this summer-long teaching series where we are studying through the first seven chapters of the book of Joshua. We're thinking together about stepping up, stepping into the promises that God has made to us. And over the last few weeks, we've been defining the blessing that God has offered, the promise that God has made to us of blessing For the Israelites coming out of Egypt and under Joshua's leadership going into Canaan, it was a land of blessing. For us, it's not a geographical spot, but it's a life of blessing. And the blessing that he has promised us is the blessing of rest. Do you remember this? That rest is his offer to us. We can live with rest, even in a chaotic and a difficult and an evil world where circumstances change all the time. Sometimes bad things happen. We can still live with rest. And the rest that he offers is this subsiding of struggle where we live in a broken world with a tranquility and a peace that is ours in Jesus. Now, last weekend we did something that's really difficult for us to do, and that is that we really endeavored to ratchet our attention away from ourselves and onto others. Do you agree with me? We can be pretty self-focused, can't we? We can be pretty self-interested and inwardly uh, focused, And so our, our endeavor last week was really try to break that cycle, break out of that selfishness, and begin to see that other people need rest as well. And we agreed together, we admitted together last week that we should not fully rest 
until we have helped other people find rest. Even though we have been given the promise of rest and we can enter into this rest and we can live with this peace and tranquility that all the while that we're experiencing rest, we should be helping other people. We shouldn't fully rest in it until we ha- are helping other people find rest as well. We agreed that we must step up to do this. And stepping up is called in Joshua chapter 1 being a person of valor. Let me show it to you. Chapter 1, verse number 14. To the tribes of Gad, Reuben, and half the tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said to them, Your wives and your children and your cattle shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side of the Jordan. But you shall pass before your brothers. You shall be armed for battle, all of you who are mighty men of valor, so that you can help them. So here's the definition. If I am helping other people find rest, I am defined by Joshua 1.14 as a person of valor. Now, do you remember the definition of valor from last weekend? Here's the word, heroism. To be a mighty man or a mighty woman of valor is to be a heroic person in the work of God. And it's not easy, is it? In fact, if it was easy, everybody would do it, right? And everybody doesn't do it. Everybody's not heroic in in the work of of kingdom work. Everybody's not uh, a man or a woman of valor. But we must step up to become so. Now, last week we identified two things that we have to do, and I want to give you this by way of review. Two things we have to do if we are going to step up and help other people find rest. Number one, we got to leave our comfort zone. I won't re-preach it. You know what it is for you. I know what it is for me. But we got to be willing to break out of our places where we're comfortable in order to move into a place where we're able to help others. And the second thing that we have to do is that we must pay a price. Men and women of valor, heroes, pay a price. What Joshua said to these men in Joshua 1.14 is, look, you got to go into battle, and some of you aren't going to come back, and you're going to battle to help your brothers, and you're going to pay a price, blood, sweat, and tears. You're going to pay a price so that they can experience the rest that you have experienced. And we talked last week about what that price is, and we d- discovered that it, it's a number of things. One, it's a, it's, I, I challenge you to pay the price of prayer. You know, that praying for others to come to faith, carrying a burden... For others, is, is work. Listen, not everybody will do it. There are churches that dot the landscape today who will never carry the burden of prayer. They'll never pay the price of prayer. They'll pray for themselves. They'll pray for their own stump toe. They'll pray for their own illnesses. Nothing wrong with that. But they'll never engage in a burden to intercede for others. We must do so. We, we talked about the burden of, of or the paying the price of, of serving, willingly serving, of coming to the place. All of us need to come to this place where we go, you know what? I've received long enough. It's time for me to participate. I've been the beneficiary of other people's service long enough. It's time for me to do some things so that other people can benefit from my service. And we talked about some different things that that looks like. In fact, I want to give you a challenge this morning because here's a really practical way that you can answer that call to pay the price of serving. When you walk through the church building tonight, you're going to see that we have dedicated three entire wings out of about 57,000 square feet of building space. We've dedicated a lot of that space to ministry to children, families with children. We want to impact the next generations, the generations to come. And so there's a lot of space for children, and we're moving from this much space to serve children to this much space to serve children. And that means that if we're going to have, we now have this many people serving in this much space in order to accommodate ministry here, we have to add this many volunteers who will serve in children's ministry. So I want to give you a challenge, very simple and just at a beginning point. Uh, our nursery director, Tiffany Jamerson, and if you know Tiffany, she does heroic work in the area of nursery ministry. Tiffany is eight weeks away from needing 50 more adults to serve in the nursery. I'm not talking about all of children's ministry, just in nurseries. She's eight weeks away from needing 50 more people to do that. I want to challenge you to say, I'll be one of those 50. This is one of the simplest things that we can do, right? I mean, 
You don't need any special skills necessarily to do this. You need to pass a, a criminal background check, and that's it. And get some training, and we'll train you. And then you can love on some children while mom and dad hear the gospel, and they can give their lives to Jesus. So I want to challenge you. I, on your bulletin today, on that connection tab that you're filling out, there's a box there that says, I want to serve in Brookstone Kids. That means nursery. And if you would check that box to go, hey, sign me up, give me some training, t talk to me about the schedule, and tell me how I can help. You know, there are some husbands and wives here who could do that together, seriously. I mean, some of you men may be looking at your wives right now going, hey, you ought to do that. Yeah, you ought to do it with her. Amen? You Husbands and wives who could do it together. There, there might be some of you who are senior saints, and you're like, I don't know what I can do. You know, I, I don't know if I can really serve much anymore. I'm telling you something you could do that would make such a difference in people's lives. And you could take your grandmotherly or grandfatherly skills and you could pour that into these children. Such an easy thing to do. And I, so I, I just fully believe that we'll get 50 at least volunteers this weekend. In fact, I'm saying, depending on vacations and all, I'll say this today uh, by the end of the next service, I will have said this to about 1,200 adults. And if we don't get 50 adults to check a box out of 1,200, I'd call that a lot of things, but I wouldn't call it heroic, right? So uh, let me ask you, be a hero. Just say, you know what, let's talk about it. I'm willing to get involved in that. So again, that's a, we, but we have to serve. We have to pay this price so that other people can come to faith. And then we talked last week about giving as well, that we need to give generously because uh, God has so blessed us and we ought to participate in that. Now, if we will do this, loved ones, if we will be men and women of valor, if we'll cross into this new land and if we'll pay a price and move out of our comfort zones, then we will see countless people who will come to faith in Jesus. Countless people whose lives will be transformed forever because we were willing to do what God called us to do. And I want to tell you, sometimes I say that or I think about that or I pray about that and I begin to personalize it. And I wonder, who are the people who are going to come to faith? What are their names? You know, God knows them, right? He already knows them. And I wonder who they are. I mean, think about it. Who is the person that you would love to see God save as we move into this new land? Maybe, it's a, maybe you're married to a guy and he's not saved. Or you're married to a woman and she's not converted. So maybe it's my spouse. I'd love to see God save my spouse. Or, or maybe it's your kids or, or your neighbors or coworkers. I don't know. But you think, I'd, I'd love for that person to stand right beside me in our new worship center and worship the Lord with me. That would be awesome if they would do that. Or I'd love to see them serving Jesus or their life transformed. Here's what I'd love for you to do, since I'm asking you to write some things and check some things on your connection tab. I'd love for you, before you leave today, to write the name that you currently have right now. You're thinking about them in your mind. I'd love for you to put their name on your connection tab. You see anywhere down at the bottom? Just put their name. And what that will be, you just put their first name. What that will become is the beginning of a prayer list for us. As we're praying about those that God is going to save as we move into this new place. And I want to tell you. God can do it. If you believe God can do it, would you say amen? And he can do it. It doesn't matter if they're the least likely person you could ever imagine. If you've, if you've thought that person will never surrender to Christ, God can do it. And he did it over and over again in the city of Jericho. And today, we're going to look at the city of Jericho, and we are going to learn salvation stories out of this city. So welcome to Jericho. Will you turn, look at your neighbor right now, and just tell them, welcome to Jericho. Tell them, welcome to Jericho. It's good. Would have been pretty awesome if when God parted the river and the Israelites walked through and they, they end up over on the uh, west bank of the Jordan River, that somebody had been standing there going, welcome to Jericho. Probably didn't happen. Let's read it. Joshua chapter 2 and verse number 1. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out of Shittim two men to spy out secretly, saying, Go view the land, go view Jericho. And they went and came into a harlot's house, whose name was Rahab, we call her Rahab, whose name was Rahab, and they, they lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came some men in here into the city of Jericho tonight from the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that have come unto you, which have entered into your house, for they have come here 
to search out all the country. We'll stop reading right there. Just like Moses, his predecessor, had done, when, when they came out, when the Israelites came out of the land of Egypt, Moses sent 12 spies into the land of Canaan to search out the land, a reconnaissance team. He sent 12 because they were to spread out and look at the whole land of Canaan. In Joshua's case, they're simply looking at Jericho, so he doesn't need to send 12. He only sends two. And these two men go in, slip in under the cover of darkness, into the city of Jericho, and begin to check out the defenses that the Israelites will have to confront as they enter into the land. And the Bible says that they go into the house of this harlot uh, who we call Rahab. Now, the question is, why Jericho? Why is Joshua so concerned with Jericho? And the answer is very simple. It's because where the Israelites cross into the land of Canaan is right against or right next to Jericho. Jericho is the very first Canaanite city that Israel will face. It will be the first battle that they will have to fight. I want to show you a picture. I brought a picture today uh, to show you the city of Jericho. And I want to orient you to what you're looking at. I brought a, a pointer. Can you, does everybody see that? Say amen if you see it. Okay. All right, here we go. So in this part of the picture where it's kind of faded, it doesn't show up too good on these projectors. But uh, up in this area, these are the plains of Moab. Now last week we talked about the plains of Moab. And this was why Reuben and Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh wanted to live on this side of the Jordan River. Because, again, you can't see it, but in this area, this is a lush pasture land. And they said, this is great land for our cattle. So these are the plains of Moab. It would extend this way and over this way, but in this picture, there it is. Now, this is the area where the children of Israel in Joshua 1 are camped, getting ready to go into the land. The Jordan River runs right here in the valley. Just that you can't see it, but it runs right through there. So they have to, from this position, cross the Jordan, and now they will be in the land of Canaan. Now, over on this picture, uh, on this side, do you see these mounds? You see this area right here? We have all this looks like mounded up dirt. This is the exact location of ancient Jericho. This is where the walls of Jericho, the city of Jericho, stood. This is called Tel Jericho, T-E-L Jericho. And Tel simply means an artificial mound that is created when a city is there, it's destroyed, and then another one builds on top of it, and it's destroyed, and another one builds on top, and the elevation comes higher and higher, and these mounds are formed. This is Tel Jericho. And you can see where archaeologists have excavated. Here's an excavation pit. There's one, there's one, there's one. Uh, there's one, there's one, there's one. All over this area, they've excavated down into the mound. Here, they cut into the side, and here is a wall, part of the ancient wall of Jericho. So this is what the Israelites were confronted with. So when they were camped over here, they were looking at Jericho standing right there. So when they came into the land, they would immediately face this enemy, the Canaanites of Jericho. Now, in Deuteronomy 34, Jericho is called the city of palms. And the reason it is is because look at it. It's an oasis in the desert. It's replete with palm trees. This entire area is watered by a spring that the Bible calls in 2 Kings 2 the spring of Elisha. And when Elisha the prophet was there, the water source there was bitter. It was poison water. And he healed those waters. And those waters, that spring, still is active today, uh, providing fresh water to that area. It's an oasis, and therefore it was along a trade route. It had many different people that would come and go uh, through Jericho. And this was a place that was a city, a capital of the land, a Canaanite city. Now, we know a lot about its culture. Uh, one of the things that we know is that it was a monarchy. Look at Joshua chapter 2, verse number 3, where we read that the king of Jericho sent word to Rahab. So there was a king, it was a nation state. This monarch ruled with brutality. Um, it also, we know some things about the worship, the religion of uh, Canaanites and the religion of Jericho. One of the things we know is that they worship the false god Baal. You read a lot about Baal in the Old Testament. They also, in Jericho, worship the moon god, the Canaanite moon god. In fact, the name Jericho means 
moon. And as part of that pagan false worship of Jericho, there were many sacrifices that were made. And archaeologists have discovered evidence even of human sacrifice to these false Canaanite gods um, in Jericho. So a defensible city, a walled city, a brutal monarchy, a place where false worship happened all of the time. It was a brutal place filled with brutal and deceived people. Now I also mentioned that it was a defensible city. And this is the reason the two spies needed to check it out. What are the defenses? And the primary defense of Jericho were its walls. Let me show you a, a rendering of what those walls were like. And this is from archaeological discoveries. They have, a, they have um, determined that the walls of Jericho were a double wall around the city. And so if you approach the city, first of all, you would have come this way. There are some, some soldiers. You would have had to have scaled the first wall to get into the city. And then there was a hill, an earthen embankment, that you would have had to climb. There's no defenses. This would have been the kill zone, if you will. No way to defend yourself in this area between the two walls. And if you could make it to the upper wall, then you would have to scale that 30-foot wall over and into the city. It was a very defensible city. And in Joshua's time, this Canaanite city had stood as the capital of Canaanite culture in that land. And it stood there. Imagine being Joshua and the people living in or camped in the plains of Moab, looking across the river and seeing this walled city. And it is the very first battle that you have to fight is to conquer these people that seemingly it would be impossible to conquer. And if you had heard any stories coming out of Jericho, if you could somehow have stood along the roadside and talked to people as they came in and out of Jericho and said, tell me about that city, you would have heard stories of brutality, you would have heard stories of false religion, you would have heard stories of human sacrifice, you would have heard stories of immorality, everything coming out of Jericho, all of the news out of Jericho, would have been ungodly and brutal news. And yet, because the Israelites were willing to have courageous faith and step into the promises of God and walk into that land, do you know that God changed the stories coming out of Jericho? God changed the testimony of Jericho? And the city of Canaanite cultic religion and brutal immorality became a city of salvation. Do you know there are three great redemption stories in the Bible that all occurred in the city of Jericho? Rahab the harlot that we just mentioned in Joshua chapter 2. Rahab the harlot. Zacchaeus the hated man. And Bartimaeus the blind and helpless man. And I want to take the time that we have remaining today and I want to talk to you about these three stories of salvation. Write them down. We're going to begin with Rahab since we're there. In Jericho, God gave faith to a harlot. I love this. God gives faith to a harlot. Now, I mentioned a moment ago that Jericho was a Canaanite city and that uh, documentation and archaeological evidence gives us a lot of information about their religion. I mentioned that there's evidence that perhaps there was even human sacrifice there. But one of the things that we know that in the worship of Baal and, and some of the other uh, false gods, deities of the day, is that there were also in their temples what we would call cultic prostitutes. Cultic, cultic prostitutes were simply women, and in some cases men as well, who would prostitute their bodies... Not for some financial gain, but rather in the sensual worship of pagan deities. Now, without getting into too much detail of, uh, of that, of course, simply understand that in those places, immorality happened as people worshipped these deities that were filled uh, with eroticism. So when the Bible says that Rahab was a harlot, it probably does not mean, although I don't know with certainty, but it's logical to, to assume, that she was not simply a prostitute, a woman of the night. 
she was more correctly, in all likelihood, a cultic prostitute who gave her body away in the temples of the Canaanite worshipers as she was with them worshiping these gods in this immoral way. All of that to say, there may not have been a less likely person in all of Jericho to believe in the God of the Israelites than Rahab. She was fully immersed in Canaanite paganism. And yet, God gave her faith. By the way, can we agree together? You cannot be saved without faith. Amen? It is impossible. Look at what the Bible says in Hebrews 11, verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For the person who comes to God must believe that God is and that God will reward him as he seeks him. Look at what Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 says. For by grace are you saved. How? Say these words. Through faith. We're saved through faith. It's not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. What is the gift of God? Well, salvation is the gift of God. But that verse says not only is salvation the gift of God, the faith that leads to salvation is the gift of God. Faith is not self-generated. No person is born naturally with more faith than another person. Spiritually dead people can't generate faith on their own. Where does faith come from? Faith is the gift by grace of Almighty God when he gives us faith to believe the gospel. Amen? And he gives us that faith how? Through his word and by his spirit. He gives us faith to believe. Well, you have a cultic prostitute in a pagan Canaanite city to whom God gives faith. Look at what the Bible says in verse number 11. Listen to this statement of great faith. Remember, these two spies come into the city. They now slip into the home of Rahab, and they hear her talking. And listen to what she says, verse 11. She says, well, actually, let's begin in verse 9. She said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land. And I know that your terror has fallen up upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did under the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of the Jordan, Sion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. Now listen to this faith statement. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Every time I read this, I can envision these two spies sitting in her living room hearing this pagan cultic prostitute say, Your God is the Lord. And they got to be looking at each other going, Can you believe she's saying this? She's preaching to them. She's telling them the true identity of their God. And by the way, her statement that your God is the Lord in heaven and in earth, that is a statement of repentance and faith. She's rejecting the pagan gods of, Cana of the Canaanites, and she's expressing her faith in their God. And how did she know about their God? Well, she had heard. Verse number 10. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. Now, do you remember? I've told you this before. When she says those words, how long ago had that Red Sea crossing happened? Forty years. That's a generation ago. And she's talking about what she knows about God because what she's been hearing for the last 40 years. While they were wandering around in the desert, the Canaanites were talking about their God. When they didn't have enough faith to believe God, the Canaanites were believing the stories of their God. She says, we've heard about how God gave you the victory over Sihon and Og and uh, the kings of the Amorites and how you utterly destroyed them. So she heard of their God. She believed in their God. And then she prays a salvation prayer. Look at verse number 12. Now therefore I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed kindness unto you, that you will show kindness unto my father's house and give me a true token. And that you will save alive my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters and all that they have. All that they have means their children, my nieces and my nephews. And deliver our lives from death. Here's the prayer. You listening? She said, save me. No more than that. She said, save us. Your God is, is God, and he's bringing his wrath upon our land. I believe in him. 
would you save us? And I love the fact that she said, don't just save me. Save my mama and save my daddy. And I got brothers. Save my brother. And I got sisters. Save my sisters. And I got little nephews and nieces. Would you save them as well? Do you know that this Rahab, this cultic prostitute, had more of a burden for her lost family members than most Baptists that will sit on pews today in church? Save us. And the Bible says that she expressed this faith, all these things that she knew about God. Listen carefully. She knew these things before she ever met an Israelite. Before the two spies ever crossed over and came into the land, before they ever sat down, before they ever had a conversation with her, she already believed. God gave her faith before they ever got into the land. Can I tell you something? If you're listening, say amen. I believe that God is doing this right now. I think God's giving faith to people who live in our new community who are going to be saved when we cross into the land. They're going to come to saving faith, and they're already believing even though we haven't even met them yet. I'm believing it. Man, you can call me crazy if you want to. I believe God's preparing their hearts right now. I think there's people that today are driving down I-26, and they're looking over at that building up on the hill, and they're going, well, that church has been talking about coming forever. They, I guess they're really coming now. They've been out in the wilderness for 40 years, but they're coming over into the land, and there's that church going up. I, when they, maybe I'll go visit. And you know what? God's given them faith right now. He's going to save them when we get into that place. Their lives are going to be transformed because God is giving them faith. And by the way, you know, I've told you this before, you know that Rahab's story changed, don't you? Joshua chapter number 6, when the... Israelite army comes into Jericho and they conquer the city. You know who survives? Of the Jerichoites, only Rahab and her mother and her father and her brothers and her sisters and all of their children. They are rescued. And you know that she married a man, a Jewish man, don't you? She was never a prostitute again. She married a man named Solomon, I believe. I don't know for sure, but I believe it was one of those two spies. She married this man named Solomon and they had a baby. And that baby had a baby, and that baby had a baby, and that baby had a baby named David. And she became the great-great-grandmother of King David. Into the lineage of Jesus she comes because God gave her faith to believe before she ever, ever met a Jew. I believe God's going to do it again in Buncombe County, don't you? God is going to save people because he's given faith right now. So God gave faith to a harlot. In Jericho, he changed the stories coming out of Jericho beginning with Rahab. Second thing, write it down, let's move quickly. In Jericho, Jesus transformed a hated man. Now you're going to have to leave the Old Testament and go to the New Testament gospel of Luke, if you will. So as you write that down, then turn to Luke chapter number 19. And I want you to know that we are going to meet a hated man by the name of Zacchaeus. And some of you right now are singing in your hearts, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. Because you grew up in BBS world, and Sunday school world, and you know those little children's songs, and that's good. In Jericho, Jesus transformed a hated man. Let's read about Zacchaeus. Luke 19, verse number 1. If you're there, say amen. All right. And Jesus entered and passed through where? Former, formerly Canaanite, pagan, brutal, immoral, human sacrifice, and cultic prostituting Jericho. Which, because God's people moved in, it changed. And now it's a Jewish city in the shadow of Jerusalem where God's people live. Jesus came to that city. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans. He was a tax collector. In fact, he was the head... IRS agent in Jericho. He was a chief of the publicans and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus who he was. And he couldn't see him because of the, the crowd of people because he was too short of little stature. I sympathize with his struggle in life. And he ran before the crowd and he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. And he was to pass, But Jesus was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to that place, he looked up and he saw him. And he said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at your house. And he made haste and he came down and received Jesus joyfully. 
And when they saw it, they being the people of the town, when all of them saw it, they all murmured, saying that Jesus had gone home to be the guest with a man that is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood after dinner with Jesus. He stood up and he said, Lord, behold, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation or fraudulently, I will restore him fourfold. And Jesus said, Salvation today has come to this house. For as much as he also was a son of Abraham, he's a Jew, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, a couple of things we know about Zacchaeus. One, he's a social outcast. He was hated in his town of Jericho. And the reason he was hated was because he had sold his soul to the Roman people. The Romans levied oppressive taxes on all the places where they would conquer territories and lands. And, and the people would have to pay these taxes to Rome. And they would have to employ tax collectors. And very often they would employ people in the communities that they had taken over. And one of those was Zacchaeus. And the people of that town hated Zacchaeus because he was one of them. And yet he was working for the Romans. And they hated that he was willing to take their resources and pay these oppressive taxes to this Roman tyrant government. And not only was he a tax collector, but the Bible says in verse number 3 that he was rich. And the implication of the passage is that he was rich because he had fraudulently enriched himself through extortion and, and through embezzlement by charging them more taxes than they had to pay. He would take some off the top and then he would pay Rome. And he had enriched himself. And they hated him. Verse six says, or verse 7 says that when Jesus went home with him, the people were indignant. I can't believe Jesus would go to his house. He's a sinner. We would never have anything to do with him. We hate that man. But Jesus went and he experienced, the Bible says, verse 6, he received Jesus joyfully. And as a result of that, his life was transformed forever. He became generous. He says, I'll give all or half my goods to the poor. And he says in verse number 8, if I have taken anything fraudulently, I will restore those that I have been unfair to fourfold. And Jesus says, salvation has come to this house. If you're listening to me, I want you to say amen. I want you to know this. There are some people in our community who are hated. And they are hated because of what they've done. And they're hated because of how they've lived. And their reputation in this community is horrible. And people know about them and they've defrauded people and they've betrayed other people. And they've been dishonest and they've been immoral and maybe they've been drunkards or whatever. But they, they're, they're disliked in this community. People look at them sometimes from within the church and they go, I can't believe that person. Here's what I want you to know. Jesus is going to save them in this new place. He's going to take people who have that kind of Zacchaeus reputation and he's going to change them forever. Surely salvation will come to their house. Because Jesus will call him by name. I love the fact that Zacchaeus runs ahead, gets up in a tree to watch Jesus come by. And Jesus gets under him and looks up and he knows him by name. If you're glad Jesus knows the name of every sinner, say amen. amen. Zacchaeus, I'm going home with you today. Get down here, man. And he's changed forever. Jesus changed the story of Zacchaeus and he changed the stories coming out of Jericho. No longer brutal, immoral, cultic, human sacrifice, Canaanite, paganism but now a city of faith and a city of transformation. There's one other one. i got to give it to you quickly. Write it down. Let's talk about it. In Jericho, Jesus gave sight to a hopeless man. Leave Luke 19, if you will, and turn back to Mark, just a few pages backwards, to Mark chapter number 10. Mark chapter 10. We're going to read about a blind man that Jesus heals at Jericho. And some of you who know your Bibles well are saying, Pastor, why are we turning to Mark? Because Luke, we're in, tells this story as well. Luke 18 has this same account. Well, I know that it does, but I want you to go to Mark's account because in Mark, he's named. And I want to know Rahab's name, and I want you to know Zacchaeus' name, and I want you to know this blind guy's name. His name is Bartimaeus. We call him blind Bartimaeus. We'll find about, uh, the story about him in Mark chapter 10, verse number 46. The Bible says they came, Jesus and his followers came to, say the name, where were they? Jericho. They came to Jericho. And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples a great number, and a great number of people following him, blind Bartimaeus, who's the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. Why? Because that's all he could do. He's blind. There's no social network for him. 
There's no help for him. There's no braille for him. There's no, there's no work, occupational therapy. Play. There's nothing he can do. He's blind, and the only way he survives is by sitting by the roadside with a cop. Help! Would you give a blind man a dime? Could you help? Alms for the poor. It's all he can do. Every day he sits there, and he knows the foot traffic. He knows when people are coming, he can hear their steps hundreds of yards away and get his cup out there. And on this particular day, there are a lot of people coming through. And he can hear a stampede of people and a lot of hustle and bustle. He doesn't know what all the crowd is about. But verse 47, somebody must have told him because he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth passing by. Maybe, I don't know, he said to somebody, hey, hey, buddy, what's going on? Why is there so many people today in Jericho? Somebody walking by said, hey, it's because Jesus, you heard of him, that, that healer, Jesus He's passing through. And the minute he hears that, Bartimaeus says, This is my opportunity. Verse number 47, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, help. Have mercy on me. You're the healer. You're the Messiah. Would you help me? Verse 48, And many of those people with Jesus said to him, Be quiet. Hold your peace. Shut up. But he didn't listen to them. He cried the more a great deal, louder, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Verse 49, and Jesus stood still. If you're glad Jesus stops when people call his name, say amen. He stopped. And he commanded them that this man would be brought to him. And they called the blind man and they said to him, be of good cheer. He's, come on, he wants to see you. A bunch of hypocrites. <laughs> this man had to go there and be going, shut up. And now Jesus goes, bring him to, oh, come, come, come. They just want to be where the party is. They bring him to Jesus. They help him get there. Verse 50, he throws away his garment, casts aside his garment. They help him come to Jesus. And when he gets there, Jesus asks what people might consider a silly question. What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said unto him, Lord, I want you to give me my sight that I might be able to see so I won't have to sit helplessly along the roadside and beg for a living anymore. Give me my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you whole. And immediately he received his sight. His life was changed forever. No longer helpless. But do you notice that Jesus said to him, go your way? But look how the verse ends. Verse number 52. He received his sight and he followed Jesus in the way. He didn't go his way. He went Jesus' way. He followed Jesus. And you know where Jesus was going? Do you read the rest of the gospel? He's going to Jerusalem. And you know why he's going to Jerusalem? It's only 18 miles away. He's going to Jerusalem because it's Passover. And you know what's going to happen on Passover? Jesus is going to be crucified. And I would suggest to you that this blind Bartimaeus, who his entire life had never seen a thing, one of the first sights he ever saw with his newly healed eyes was the Son of God hanging on a cross, dying for his sin. Three days later, he rose from the dead. And the Bible tells us in the book of Acts that after Jesus rose from the dead, there were 500 people that saw him alive at one time. And I don't know this for sure, but I just like to believe that one of those 500 was blind Bartimaeus, who had, formerly blind Bartimaeus, who had never seen anything in his life, but because of the mercy of Jesus, he found hope. And I want to tell you, there are some hopeless people that you know and I know and we live around and they, they live in our community and they are going to find hope hope in Jesus they're going to find hope on that new property that we're moving to where we're going to stand tonight because God is changing the stories coming out of Jericho and God's changing the stories coming out of that property go back to Joshua 2 just to close our time together verse number 9 Rahab says to them I know that God has given you this land and because God gave them that land every story that came out of Jericho now was a salvation story. Not a, not a Canaanite, pagan, cultic, brutal, human sacrifice, pagan deity story, but a salvation story. And I want you to hear me today. God's changing the stories coming off that mountain because we're going into the land. You say, Pastor, what do you mean? What, what do you mean God's changing the story? Why would the story change? What could the stories have been coming off that property? Well, many of you will know this. We've talked about it in the past, but it's been a couple of years, I think, since we even brought this up or talked about this much. What some of you don't know is that the, the 100 acres where we will move to do ministry in a few weeks, before we owned that property and before the owners that owned it, that we purchased it from bought that property, years ago, 
that property was slated to become an East Coast headquarters, if you will, for a cultic organization called The Way International. Now, The Way International was uh, started in the uh, mid to late 1950s. Um, it, at one time, in the 70s, was all over the world. Had uh, way more than, uh, far more than 100,000 uh, people who were involved in it. And cult watchers who watched these sorts of organizations would clearly, clearly define The Way International as a cult. Their doctrinal beliefs are very similar to Jehovah's Witnesses. In the, in the late 1970s, that property was to have become a location for the Way International in this part of the country. Their headquarters is in Ohio. It was to have become a headquarters here. The people who lived on this property at that time didn't own it. They farmed it. And when word got out in the community that this was about to happen, the believers in that community and the people who lived there were Christians. They, they came together and they wanted to pray that God would not allow that to happen, that there wouldn't be a cult that would rise up in Weaverville and begin to deceive people. And so they did that. They began to pray. And in those prayers, or out of those prayers, they called Ralph Sexton Sr. Do any of y'all know? remember Ralph Sexton Sr., founding pastor of Trinity Baptist Church? Well, they called Ralph, and Ralph had a tent ministry, and they said, Ralph, would you bring your tent out to Weaverville, put it up in this cornfield where we're going to go tonight, and we're baptized there tonight, and would you preach a revival, and let's ask God to preserve this property? Well, I just got to think about this yesterday, and so I, I called uh, Ralph Sexton Jr., and I said, I don't know if you've got any pictures of your dad's tent handy, but would you send me one if you do? Well, he did, and so here it is. Now, there's the tent. Now, that's not the property. That's in a different location, but that's the tent that went up where you're going to be tonight, and under that tent, a group of Christians in 1978 or 1979, under Ralph Sexton's leadership, got on their knees in that cornfield and they said, God, would you stop the ability of a cult to come to this property? And they prayed this. Are you listening? If you're listening, say amen. amen. They prayed, would you raise up a church that will preach the gospel on this property? Ralph has told me numerous times that he helped set that tent up. He remembers that meeting well. They prayed that God would raise up a church. It wasn't too long after that tent meeting that that property went into foreclosure. It was bought off the courthouse steps by the family that we purchased the property from in 2007. And when you go to that property tonight, you will stand in the field where God's people met under that tent and ask God to preserve that property and raise up a church. And you will look up on the hill and you will see the tangible, physical answer of that prayer by Almighty God. And the stories that would have come off that mountain would have been stories of deception. And I'm here to tell you, God changed the story of Jericho, and he changed the story of that mountain, and forever stories of salvation will come because God's people trusted him to move into the land. Amen.